Okay, hello everybody. I'm gonna go ahead and get started here. Um, my name is Arika Viraponsi. I'm the principal scientist from Middle Path Eco Solutions, um, and I've been coordinating this webinar series for ESIP. Um, and today we have um, our webinar is on the information pathway for earth science data between the supplier and user. Um, and we have three panel presenters. Um, and this is the second webinar for ESIP's first series. Um, and, and so the, today we, the, the presentations will be about um, the, um, um, about looking at the, the information pathway as to how data and tools are transferred and moved between suppliers and end users. Um, and the demands between these ends of the path of the path can be leveraged to produce better tools and more useful information. So we're hoping to provide some of these to, to show and explain some of these approaches that are out there. Um, these different tools are available to understand, analyze, and streamline the information pathway. Um, and uh, the structure for this webinar is that we'll have the, uh, the first three, we'll have three presenters, um, and they'll, they'll each present um, for about 10 minutes, and then we're gonna have um, a discussion, um, questions. So please, if you have any questions you'd like to ask as the presenters are presenting, then you can just put it into the chat box here. Um, and we can, um, and we'll, we'll ask your questions. Um, and there's also a sign-in sheet um, for the webinar. Uh, there is, a, the link is, is um, in the chat box. So it'd be great if you could just add your name and your email. And all of these, um, these webinars will be available on the ESIP YouTube. So our, so our first presenter is Andrew Coot, Andy Coot, um, and, uh, and Andy has over 30 years of experience in the development and use of information systems. He specializes in the management of location-enabled applications. Um, and since then, he's, he's founded the IT consultancy called Consulting Ware. Um, he now, um, he now he now does strategic and business consultancy assignments in both the pro public and private sectors around the world. He's been involved in the development of GIS and spatial data infrastructures. Um, and more recently, he's been um, undertaking international international assignments for the EU as part of the Inspire initiative. Um, he has expertise in business case in terms of the cost benefit return on investment studies that include work for the World Bank and and assessing the value of geospatial technology to local governments. Um, so Andy, I'm gonna let you begin. So hello everybody, well, whether it's morning or afternoon. Uh, Arika, thank you uh, very much. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how we use value chain techniques uh, for looking at uh, particularly the third dimension of, of geo-information, clearly with uh, capabilities like satellites and drones and so on, the availability of 3D information is becoming uh, much more affordable. And uh, the project that we undertook, we were looking to uh, uh, establish uh, what that value might be. So next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. Um, sorry, what, uh, one back. Okay, sorry, they're in the wrong order. Uh, I'm just gonna talk to you about a case study. This uh, uh, was one that we undertook as an organization last year for uh, Euro SDR, which is a research organization made up of national mapping organizations. I thought I'd also give it just a quick um, update on uh, um, uh, some of the, the principles around valuing information, take you through how we use value chain analysis, what the deliverables were, and uh, just for the, the uh, lead into the discussion, some of our conclusions from that. So next slide, please. This is not changing very fast on my system. Uh, Arika, I don't know whether you can, uh, there we go, thank you very much. Um, so uh, 
what Euro SDR has traditionally done is look at, uh, at technical research, but this was more around business themes. Uh, when we started on this project, we, we made it clear that making an economic appraisal for 3D geo information per se was not really possible. What we needed to do, first of all, was identify uh, some uh, attractive user cases, use cases which we would, uh, um, uh, we would use as the, as the basis for the work. Uh, the first step uh, in each use case was to uh, understand the, use, uh, the, the value chain, uh, the actors, uh, and how using uh, the data they, they actually could create actionable information. Uh, the quantification was a follow-on process which we, which we used for a couple of the use cases for which we, uh, uh, we use the value chain. So next slide, please. So just a, a few words on, on valuing information. Uh, information has no intrinsic value. Uh, it only has value once it has actually been uh, applied to a particular use case. Uh, next slide. Sorry, next uh, one. Uh, and what we mustn't do is uh, confuse the value of information with the value of the benefits from the policies or the systems that actually use it for decision making. So. When we, if this is a general problem with, with um, the economic benefits of information, uh, that we have to compare what we're planning on doing with what's called a counterfactual, which is uh, what else could you use? And in the, in the world today, we have a lot of alternative sources of information. So a national mapping organization creating 3D information has to compare the value that they're adding uh, in comparison with, with say, using uh, Google Earth or uh, Google Maps. So uh, what we need to evaluate is the difference in the value between what the project is planning to do and the next best alternative. So next slide. So one of the ways that we thought would be attractive to, uh, uh, to do this and to focus people quickly on value, uh, that was the key thing we were trying to do, get people to think about uh, dollars or whatever currency they they were using and where the value was was being added so a value chain describes a flow of interactions between organizations it was originally developed for looking at supply chains but has more recently been uh, adapted for uh, the purpose of, of looking at where value is added and so what we were looking to do as part of this uh, exercise was to run through the stages of the supply chain from the supplier right through intermediaries who, who may package data together or create analyses on it through to the uh, the real end users who may be consumers or, or they may be uh, uh, organizations um, in the public sector but also in the private sector. Thank you. Next slide. So here's a very simple example of a, of a value chain. This one is for uh, forestry. It's, uh, it's based on a study that was done in Finland in 2014. And at that kind of level, it's, it's a useful graphic to present to senior management. Um, but in fact, what we wanted to do was, was delve into more depth and look at each of these actors and the kinds of uh, uh, benefits that would, uh, would, would flow from the use of 3D information. So next slide, please. What we did was we selected um, six use cases for 3D geo-information, and these were all where the, across uh, a, uh, a number of different uh, European countries, um, there was a recognition that uh, this was these were use cases that had the potential to add a significant amount uh, by the use of 3D information. So uh, I'm not going to talk about each of these. I'm just because we have limited time. I, I'm just going to focus on one or two. So the next slide, please. So the methodology that we used was relatively straightforward. We brought together uh, a range of stakeholders 
from the private sector, consumer groups, as well as uh, the uh, producers of the in information. Uh, we ran a, an interactive full day workshop. Um, and what we did during that was we actually created uh, a first cut value chain for the, the use of 3D information as applied to uh, the one I'm going to talk about in most detail is uh, uh, for urban development or planning. We modeled the value chain at a high level. Um, and what we did was go through the, the, the modeling exercise, which uh, we did on a, a series of whiteboards um, uh, across quite a large area of a, a, of a laboratory wall. And uh, then we, um, we looked to identify where we thought as a group the greatest social or economic va value would be, uh, uh, would be added. And we went through an exercise of, of saying that each of the individuals should think in terms of uh, uh, being in a position of a decision maker and where would they actually allocate their, uh, uh, we gave them five dollars to, uh, to, to spend. Um, and on the basis of that we were able to um, uh, get a rough indication of the of the highest impact processes. Next slide. We produced a number of deliverables from this, including uh, an executive summary and uh, uh, presentations. And I'm going to show you some of these things, but at the end, there's a, um, a reference where you can go and look at this in further detail. Next slide. So this particular um, uh, value chain was for flood management. And on the left-hand side, you can see we have raw data. We then have information, products and services being produced from that raw, raw data. Aggregators and, and what we might call uh, value added intermediaries uh, in, the, in the third area. And then on the, on the right hand side, we have uh, uh, a variety of end users. Um, what you can hopefully see as well is these, uh, these small yellow stars. These were ones that we put onto the board to indicate where we thought the, uh, the, the maximum value of 3D for flood management uh, would actually occur. This is, a, this is a summary slide. The actual uh, information that we produced was, was much richer than this, but we decided that this was probably about as much as people could uh, consume and make sense of. But uh, just thinking about those priorities, the next slide gives us an indication of uh, one of our other deliverables. So next slide. So this was a ranked series of benefits from this, uh, this workshop, uh, looking at the, the actor, what the process that was going to be influenced by uh, the introduction of 3D data would be, and what the potential benefits were. Um, and uh, on the right hand side, you can see uh, the scoring from the, uh, the, the group of experts that we that we had involved. OK, next slide. So having gone through this exercise for all six of the, uh, uh, the use cases that we, we chose, our conclusion was that this was actually a quick and effective technique for identification of key socioeconomic benefits. And it allowed us to then move into a more concentrated study um, uh, using cost benefit analysis for two of those particular uh, cases. What we found was that the highest area of value was predominantly on the demand side. Uh, that's unsurprising, but that the suppliers, in this case, national mapping organizations and uh, some other public sector organizations, poorly understood what the products that they were aiming to produce uh, would actually mean to the end users. So it had a side benefit here that it allowed them to refine the uh, uh, products that they were producing on the basis of a better understanding of how those products would be used and where they would uh, uh, add the most benefit. And I suppose my, my summary point is that uh, um, there is uh, a likelihood that without these kind of exercises, um, uh, suppliers can take the attitude that if you build it, uh, they will come, whereas particularly in the uh,
data abundant world that we live in now, uh, that is uh, very much not the case. Uh, and they have to think very hard about uh, where their niches are uh, that the, uh, the likes of Google will not be able to fill. Okay, uh, final slide. Right, so the final slide here is, uh, is just giving you a link to the uh, research report that we produced. Um, also, uh, I will update that final slide because uh, we have produced uh, now a book which um, is, uh, is available from uh, Taylor and Francis. And uh, this goes into a lot more depth about socioeconomic benefits, particularly applied to uh, uh, earth observation and to uh, uh, geospatial information. And with that, I'll finish. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy, for, for that um, presentation. And as I mentioned before, we're going to, if you have questions, please put them into the chat box um, and we'll, we'll ask all of the questions to the panel at the end of the presentations. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Emily Pindili. Um, she's an economist and, a, and the, the lead for the natural resources um, economics theme at, um, the US, at USGS. Um, she specializes in economic and policy analysis to support energy and environmental projects. Her portfolio of environmental and informational economics research topics include the value of scientific information, ecosystem services assessment evaluation, methods to integrate multidisciplinary analyses to support land use decision making, life cycle analyses of resource development and conservation, and environmental markets. Um, she's focused on integrated ecologic economic analyses and incorporating the social and earth sciences into decision making. Okay, Emily, thank you very much for being here. Emily, I think you might be muted. Can you hear me? Yes, you are now on. Okay, thank, thank you so much. Um, thank you. So um, what I was saying while I was on mute is that I'm going to talk about a case study that we did here at USGS and how we use decision trees to understand the value of our stream gauge network. Next slide. Okay. Just a second. Okay. Okay, so just very briefly, I uh, work in a group called the Science and Decision Center, and uh, we have a number of different disciplines, including hydrology and ecology, along with our economic staff, and we work across five themes, and um, Erika really mentioned a lot of those in the natural resource economics. So next slide. So just at the beginning, um, understanding what a particular Earth observation or information product does is really important when trying to value information. And the stream gauges provide uh, critical information. Um, it's a very large network you see on the map there. And um, there are 7,600 gauges uh, just in our national network, and there's many other partner gauges around the country. And they provide real and uh, historical data on stream stage and flow, and it's readily and freely available. So really, um, the important thing there is it's essentially a public good, and so it's not something that you could look to the market to understand what the value is. Next slide. So I just want to quickly flip through a couple of um, slides about the different benefit areas, and then I'll focus in on one. Uh, one of the important things um, that stream gauges are used for are looking at trends to predict floods. Next slide. 
I'm sorry, drought. And also to forecast flood. Next slide. Um, it's used to look at hazards. It's really helpful um, to determine uh, big flooding. You can see in the bottom left quadrant there, um, that's helping to look at vulnerability, for instance, of a, um, of a city. Next slide. It's used to plan infrastructure, and this is where I'll draw in, um, but things like determining how large a bridge needs to be above a river. Um, if you look at a 50-year record, you get a much better understanding of how high that river may actually go, uh, building culverts, building water treatment plants and reservoirs. Next slide. Water allocation, like I mentioned, reservoirs. Uh, maintaining the amount of water needed for fish populations. Uh, next slide. Looking at water quality and understanding how you distribute different pollutants in knowing how much water you have. Next slide. And also for recreation. So if you look at your gauge and say, ah, it's a little bit low. If I go out canoeing, I'm going to bump too much. Uh, that can save you from a trip. Um, also for bigger commercial navigation needs, and uh, there you see some lock systems. It's, it's a really important information. Next slide. So that's just a little bit on the surface of what kind of benefits stream gauge information provides. And for this study, we're doing sort of a typical approach in environmental economics, looking at individual benefit categories or applications, looking specifically at the outcomes and monetizing the effects. Uh, whereby ultimately we'll add those up. Next slide. So what we looked in detail at is how is stream gauge information used to design a culvert and what are the different risks associated with not having that information. Essentially culverts what you'll see under a highway or road to allow water to pass so it's going to be smaller than a bridge um, and to design those they use precipitation, uh, they want to understand the type of through flow of surface water and the fluctuations in the flow of, of the river. And all of those are things that stream gauge information can provide. Next slide. And so one of the important things is um, there is information if you go and look at a bank uh, of a stream, uh, but it doesn't provide that historical information such as a 100-year storm came through or drought and what it would look like in terms of how much it might overflow. Um, so it's really, we think it's important to have this information to optimize culvert hydraulic capacity. Next slide. And so um, Andrew mentioned this, there, there's not no information if there weren't string gauge information. And this is just a quick figure showing how increasing information helps. Uh, bankful information is essentially the physical properties of the river, and that's estimated to give about a, about a two-year storm recurrence and has a standard error of 51% for the 100-year storm. Um, so it's not really giving you great information. There are regression equations um, that USGS also developed based on other stream gauge sites. Um, they're developing essentially an extrapolation to estimate what would happen at a certain area. And then best available data would be a stream gauge right there, which is giving you a real observation. Um, and it's not just having that gauge, but having a historical record. So the longer the record, the more accurate it's going to be. Next slide. And as I promised, uh, we used a decision tree approach. Essentially, we wanted to look at how the data is used and what the possible outcomes were without the data, so the counterfactual, the likelihood that those would occur, and the monetized cost. Um, so one, one um, engineer has said that anyone can make a culvert large enough, but it's in the province of the engineer to design one of sufficient but not extravagant size. So essentially, if you didn't have the data, there's some possibility that it would be too large, 
and the cost of that would be additional materials, uh, but you don't have very high risk of um, having overflow or washout of the culvert itself. And there's also a possibility that it's right-sized with some probability, and that it's too small. Um, there are uh, higher risks of a washout, but you do get those savings in terms of materials. So it's more frequent that it's going to be too large, and um, it's at some point that it's going to be optimized. Next slide. So we looked to the literature. We had to try to understand what goes into the um, design of culverts. We talked to many other departments and uh, partners. And we also talked to uh, disaster response entities to understand the kinds of impacts that would occur if a culvert was too small. Next slide. And so ultimately, the, the first step was to look at the outcomes of those decision paths that I just talked about. And so what are the cost of construction and installation? And um, what would it be if it was underbuilt? So we just focused on the underbuilt scenario. And these are all of the damages that would occur, uh, the direct impacts. If you had a, a washout, there would be flooding of adjacent property, which could be crops. It could be property. Uh, roadway flooding, and you have to replace pavement or the embankment. You would have interruption to traffic, which has real costs in terms of um, travel time savings. Uh, there could also be potential risks of injury for people who tried to drive through high water that had flown over um, the culvert, and also damage to the stream and the floodplain. Next slide. So we used a number of approaches to actually estimate um, what those damage costs were, uh, things like property damage is avoided, uh, real cost of replacing pavement or embankment repairs. And we used a couple of non-market um, costs, such as um, the time, time travel savings and uh, distances, also value of statistical life and, and injuries. And we didn't attempt in this study to look at the value of water quality or floodplain services. And so essentially, we looked at a number of different scenarios, different events, and their probability. So for instance, the 100-year flood, which has a 1% risk, and a 50-year flood, um, which has a, um, a higher risk there. And so we're going to add those all up to get an annual value. Next slide. And like I mentioned, we just looked at the underbuilt scenario. We had a, a lot of challenges finding data, but we did find one data set where there were 21 culvert overtopping events, and we used that. We associated a couple of those events with real gauges, and we looked at the different historical peak flows to estimate um, the exceedance values in terms of flooding for the different storm frequencies I mentioned, and developed cost damage functions associated with the different um, exceedance values for those storms. Next slide. So we did have some data. Um, it has not yet been published, but um, it was anywhere from $10,000 a year avoided up to a million dollars a year avoided in uh, at a single gauge station uh, for a single culvert. So you can imagine uh, extrapolating that to the whole US. Uh, it could be a very large number. And it's not going to be equal in, in different places. In drier places, it's not as much of a concern. Um, in wetter places, you're likely to be much more overbuilt. Uh, but where you sort of get these perfect storms that it's built too small, uh, the damages are much higher in those cases. What we learned from this study was it was difficult to get the physical data. So the economics was not the, not the difficult part, but really finding the data on um, the impacts was challenging. And we also found people were always happy to talk about stream gauges. They really love to have them. They use them in many ways. But it's challenging to quantify the value. And finally, that um, it's, it's definitely useful for stream gauges to be used in culvert design, uh, but that more work really needs to be done to understand the difference between having a gauge, having just a regression, uh, and other alternative pieces of data. Next slide. Great, thank you so much.
Thank you very much, um, Emily, for, for that presentation. Um, I'm going to move on now to um, Danny Vandenbroek um, from KU Leuven. And uh, Danny is a research management uh, manager at KU Leuven. He's led more than 70 research and consultancy projects in the, fields of, in the field of geographic information, earth observation, and spatial data infrastructures. His work focuses on assessing the maturity and performance of SDIs and the impact of implementation of geospatial standards on the performance of business processes. He's actively involved in different standardization bodies, such as the Open Geospatial Consortium. Um, he's also contributed to setting up the European Union Location Framework. And currently, mm -hmm. he's the Scientific and Technical Coordinator of um, EO4GEO, the Space Geospatial Sector Skills Alliance under the Aramis Plus program. Um, and then currently he's also he's working on a project that um, seeks to design um, GIEO education and training curriculum to better match sector needs and to help improve the performance of a location enabled business processes. So I'll now turn it over to Danny. Okay, thank you so much. First, I want to thank the organizers for having this opportunity to share my ideas and my experience in one particular uh, project where we look to the Copernicus value chain. Um, maybe the subtitle ha should have been a little bit different. It's of course not only to improve access to the data, but mainly also improving the usage of the data. Next slide, please. Uh, so I will briefly give you some context of the Copernicus program and, the, and then I will focus on the Copernicus value chain and how we try to improve and get this value by a very focused skills development approach. And I will end with some ongoing work. Next slide. Uh, I assume that most of the people here in the webinar know about the Copernicus program. Uh, in fact, the Copernicus program was meant to stimulate the user uptake of the wealth of space data, mainly through services, uh, because in the past it was acknowledged that the usage was suboptimal, that there were a lot of data out there uh, from ESA, from other uh, international organizations such as NASA and other programs. But uh, the idea of Copernicus is to focus more and more to transform all these data, not only satellite imagery, but also in situ data into value added information by processing and analyzing the data and by providing the data to end users. Next slide. Um, so as I said in, in the past, and this is a recent development with the Copernicus program, uh, of course you need the basic infrastructures, uh, whether it's Copernicus infrastructure, statistical infrastructure, GI infrastructures, such, such as spatial data infrastructures, you need data and other components to build further upon. But we see uh, a shift from the mere focus on the infrastructure per se, too, and that's shown in the next slide, to uh, the user uptake through uh, direct services. Usually the services meant by Copernicus are in, the, in practice applications, so they present the information derived from the raw data into a certain format, in, into a certain environment, usually in specific portals, but we speak in fact uh, on about applications and apps on, on mobile devices and so forth. But also more and more additional platforms where, for example, developers can find or can have access to the data, not only to the data, but also to some tools or to some environments on top of which they can build then further new applications. And in the case of Copernicus, there are so-called six services uh, one on atmosphere, another on climate, emergency, marine, land, and security. So that are the six uh, services currently available. Next slide. Uh, 
yeah, there has been in the context of Copernicus very recently, but I will not in detail brief you about this study because this study is available online on the Copernicus website. There has been a study on the economical, societal and environmental benefits uh, released and developed by PwC end of 2017, where they tried to estimate the monetary value of all the benefits uh, mainly for intermediate and end users, so intermediate users that are the organizations and users that are making and processing Copernicus data and services to do to create added value applications. Um, and the idea was in that way to provide an ID for governments what is the potential return on investment. Uh, in the green box there are a few highlights from the study. The study is very extensive, almost 200 pages. Um, and some of the highlights are that uh, we can see an evolving ecosystem around Copernicus information and the services, where also we see uh, emerging some vibrant startup, startups. Uh, also, it is important to understand that uh, Copernicus uh, focuses on full free and open data policies so that uh, the, they can stimulate the uptake of the data in applications. Uh, we also can see in this study that there has been a, a real doubling and a raising of number of users of Copernicus, registered users, towards almost 150,000. And the study also revealed that overall the benefit for European society, so all the type of benefits altogether for a longer period are estimated between 67 and 130 billion euro. Also, of course, there is specific annual revenue for the space industry and there's the creation of jobs. But one of the important uh, side remarks and also observations was that in order to generate this value, it is necessary to improve the skills, the required skills to make this happen. Next slide. So that's that's why uh, a specific project under Erasmus Plus was initiated, which is called EO4GEO, uh, where the idea is that we need uh, a more innovative strategy for skills development and capacity building for the space and geoinformation sector to support this Copernicus user uptake. So the project only started at the beginning of this year. Uh, it will run for four years. It has 26 core organizations and a lot of associated partners from different countries and some sub areas are tackled in this project, namely integrated applications, smart cities and climate change. Next slide, please. So, uh, as I said, this uh, project uh, is under the Erasmus Plus uh, program. Uh, it's one of the sector skills alliance. There are other alliances in other fields like defense, tourism, and so forth. But this one is specifically focusing on uh, an alliance for implementing this new strategic approach, which will be then formulated in a blueprint for development of the specific sector uh, skills uh, for our space slash geoinformation sector. Um, next slide. That's for the context. Now, in this project and overall in Copernicus, uh, the co specific Copernicus value chain has been discussed for years now. Uh, as part of the, the project, we start from this value chain to define our work. Uh, of course, the current situation for the value chain, which is existing, of course, it has been developed by ERSC, that's an association representing the remote sensing companies in Europe. Uh, it's quite centralized. So you have, of course, the infrastructure delivering a lot of data, and then you have consultancy companies and software companies that try to add value by providing and developing GI services, but that's up till now quite centrally organized and uh, steered by European Commission services. And of course, uh, in a lot, a lot of public sector bodies, they have their own internal service departments that are doing exactly this. They process the data, they do something with it, and then they uh, expose the data to uh, their own scientific people or even end users. Next slide. 
Now, the future vision for the value chain is that this would become more uh, distributed, less centralized, where you have inter alia uh, added value service providers that can work online remotely, have access to the data uh, based on uh, IT platforms. There is new developments in Copernicus with the development of DIAS and that it would become available online uh, for the downstream sector industry so that they can create new apps for end users. Uh, online but also offline of course uh, in different ways so that is probably and we see it emerging the new value chain how it would be organized for uh, copernicus next slide uh, what we want to do in the context of EO4GO is not uh, remain at the level of the general um, value chain but to look into much deeper detail uh, on particular what we call working processes where this added value and this uptake is happening. So that's why we say we need to understand individual scenarios or work processes in particular areas. For example, what are the processes and activities uh, where spatial, geospatial, but also other data and information is used. What are exactly the actors performing these activities? How do they interact? And how are the data and is the information flowing throughout this process? Uh, so uh, quality of process and their outcomes depend largely in this context on the actors having the right skills to do so. Next slide. So therefore, we uh, developed a, a new approach to do what we call curricula design. Uh, so, as I said before, EOFGO will try to focus on specific processes in different sub-areas, climate change, smart cities and integrated applications, which will be in fact e-government uh, uptake. Uh, in that case, or in this, uh, for these scenarios or for this, this particular work process, we will try to model uh, these work processes uh, with BPMN so that we have a good insight in particular uh, uh, processes or sub-processes and that will be the start to do the curriculum design. So we will split the process in activities, we will know or we will model the different actors. For an actor you can say that they have a specific profile, expert profile or occupational profile. Based on the activities we will know when analyzing them uh, which is the knowledge, what are the skills, what are the competences that are needed to support these activities. We can then translate that into learning outcomes and the learning outcomes will become part of curricula design. Next slide, please. At the same time, we want to know what might be the impact of improving the skills for people working in these particular work processes. So therefore we have a kind of micro level uh, impact measurement where we look into the process performance, where we will do ex ante and ex post measurements. Information will be collected mainly through interview with the actors, but also some observations because we are with some other partners active in these different work processes. Um, and partially it will be qualitative and quantitative uh, and to be honest it will be rather estimates rather than, really, uh, rather than hard measurements. Uh, parameters that we want to look at is mainly time elements and quality but also eventually costs uh, with different subtypes. Next slide please. As uh, a second uh, element uh, of measuring impact will macro level at, uh, Europe, at the eu 4 project level. Um, what uh, might that uh, be? Well, we want to analyze really if with improved skills, the uptake and the added value development is uh, improving, is really uh, better. Uh, Information that we collect there will be the through the follow-up of students, Copernicus alumni, students, uh, what we call them. Uh, it will be also embedded in the uh, Copernicus program because EOFGO will develop a long-term action plan and it will be embedded in the generic and general Copernicus program. We will do it through uh, different indicators uh, and also through the collection of cases and user stories. Um, 
we have currently integrated that as part of the quality assurance and evaluation process of eo geo and in the orange box you see a few parameters that we might look into, uh, for example, uh, new solutions that are developed, the number of new apps and services developed, but also the number of end users for of these apps, uh, the, the way the ecosystem around Copernicus is evolving, if there are new Copernicus users that follow the training action, but also new companies and individuals that develop new apps, for example. Next slide, please. So what is the plan to work now in the next couple of months? Uh, we have developed or we are currently that's work in progress uh, developing the scenarios and these will be chosen very shortly and then modeling will start. Then we will through the stakeholders try to collect information on performance. The tra training actions will then be organized uh, in different stages and then we will go back and measure the impact by assessing how the processes develop and also how the long-term impact is evolving uh, and that will be then measured and documented and to do so another project also is in under preparation to focus more on a real performance measurement framework and developing that and testing that in that uh, project next slide and that's the last one uh, some conclusions, no, one slide, going back one slide, yeah, so uh, conclusions so far is that in order to have value added created in the Copernicus value chain, we uh, deem that it is necessary to focus also on skills development that should be taken into account. Uh, currently, uh, there is really a lack of the right skills to support that development of added value in this uh, value chain uh, and that might impede user uptake and is impeding user uptake and it might also affect process performance and then uh, currently we are in an initial stage with EO4GEO to experiment with a new innovative method for designing curricula uh, starting from the, the work process in which people work and also uh, try to connect to that an approach to collect information about performance and impact. And with that, I end my presentation. Thank you. I'd like to, I'd like to thank all of the um, presenters for those um, wonderful presentations. Um, we're going to move now into the into the questions. Um, so we do have a, a yes? oh, go ahead. Okay, it looks like there are some in chat if you wanted to um, see those ones. Okay, yes. Okay, yes. So we've got a few um, questions from the audience. Um, and um, so for the first question, I think this might apply best to um, Andy and Emily. Um, so you both presented about, you know, the value chain method as well as decision trees. Um, um, how do you select use cases and validate, you know, what are the best use cases for these approaches and how do you validate the results of a use case? Shall I start? Yes, go ahead, Andy. Okay, so um, in terms of selection, we, um, uh, we had a quite, we used quite a, a novel approach, but uh, in Europe we have a a thing called the Eurovision Song Contest, which may have made it across the uh, uh, the pond. But here you have people who actually um, uh, sing and then each panel in each country actually vote for the best best ones. So what we did was we put together a, a long list of use cases for 3D geo information. And then we gave each of the, um, uh, the countries uh, five votes and uh, we got them to select on the basis of what would be the long-term socio-economic benefits of, uh, of of each of these use cases. Uh, we then looked at the results of that and, and uh, there was a certain amount of um, trading between countries where some of the use cases were not particularly uh, valuable. I mean in uh, southern Europe they don't have a lot of uh, as much forestry certainly as northern Europe uh, and uh, in the end we uh, we we got down to uh, six which was really what we felt we could cope with within the the budget and the time scale in terms of the outcomes 
uh, two of the uh, the value chains we took through to cost benefit analysis, and uh, the results of that were that uh, both um, uh, urban planning and uh, flood management were uh, had a positive return on investment over a uh, a ten year period that we that we looked at, and of course because the data is only collected once, um, these are additive. So if you're able to uh, um, use the 3D information for a variety of different use cases, um, then the, uh, the return on investment improves further. Great, this, this is Emily and, and I can just um, provide what we've done to choose the use case. Um, Usually it's working in partnership with um, either the manager of an information product or stakeholders and uh, looking at, you know, starting with what's sort of the full scope and, you know, sort of quick brainstorming activities and then coming up with um, the higher impact. So we're looking for something that uh, where we think the impacts are, are high and where it's feasible to do the economics. Um, you know, some of those more challenging areas that all of the benefits might be non-market uh, type ecosystem services. Uh, we may not chase those depending on our timeline, um, but things like with safety implications, you know, we're anticipating that those will have uh, high impacts. And in other cases, it's completely directed by, you know, this. I'm the manager of this information. And I'm really interested to know how this user group needs um, uses the information and for you to evaluate that. So it may be it may be that approach as well. Great, thank you so much for those responses. Um, and then um, I think this can go out to um, all three panelists. Um, what are some alternative approaches that might be appropriate, you know, as opposed to what you've you've been using to address your use cases? Maybe uh, Danny, maybe you can start. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, well, uh, one of the things we, we see in other studies and in other projects is that more and more uh, uh, having user stories on particular cases, uh, bringing together uh, the different uh, actors involved in a particular process, for example, in our case, bring them together and have their story stories tell. So, for example, a Delphi panel can help there to have opinions and to collect information. Uh, so that's a little bit different because we um, we will focus, for example, more on these uh, observations and then collecting information during the work processes on performance and impacts by the people directly involved. Uh, but we do not or we do not plan for the time being to bring people experts together for example in a, in a Delphi panel but that would perfectly be possible because I remember still uh, a study from Bruce Hamilton from NASA who was exactly doing that and it revealed some interesting results. Emily do you do you want to comment or shall I? Sure um and you know one one other method that I could mention is just the contingent valuation where you um, survey people to try to uh, get after their preferences for a, a certain type of information and um, well, I think for the most part, the decision tree is oriented towards uh, a revealed preference where you're really looking at how is this used and how does it influence outcomes um, that alternative tries to understand. Uh, what people would be willing to pay for the data and um, and estimate it in that in that approach. Thanks, Andrew. So um, uh, the the geo value book, which I I trailed at the uh, at the end of my presentation, um, in one of the chapters there we look at alternative approaches. Uh, there are a number of different economic approaches. Danny's talked about uh, Delphi, which uh, is uh, a group of experts where there's little data available and, and you ask them to assess what benefits might be. Um, Emily's talked about willingness to pay. One of the disadvantages of willingness to pay is that uh, uh, it requires quite a large number of samples and that's often uh, prohibitively expensive to, uh, uh, to mount. 
Um, and then um, cost benefit analysis uh, is, uh, is commonly used in, uh, um, in the economic community, particularly at a, a project level. And you can carry this further through into uh, what's called CGE modeling, which is uh, um, uh, equilibrium uh, modeling approach, uh, looking at converting the benefits that, that may be for individual sectors into what effect they have on uh, the overall GDP of the economy. So there are a number of different methods and often they're determined by, as Emily I think said, the, the time you have available um, and the, uh, uh, the budget of the, uh, of the client. Yeah, we've got another question from the audience. Um, how do you envision, so, so thinking about, I think, a, a feedback cycle, how do you envision feeding the effects uh, back to refining the models or services that are provided in an automated or semi-automated way? Um, perhaps, Danny, we can start with you again. Yeah. Um, how you really bring that back, it's maybe more difficult to, to assess. Uh, but it's true that uh, we deem that uh, by automating more in, for example, these work processes that we are analyzing, that uh, the benefits and the gains are improving as well. Now, I think in the case we are focused on is a little bit different because um, not everything can be automated and we are also looking into the dynamics of the market. If we speak about uptake, it's not only on the usage of the data and the service from Copernicus, but it's also on um, new companies that can be initiated, uh, doing some new things with it, uh, developing a new app, for example, on one of the Copernicus services. Even some citizens in uh, Croatia last year with the big forest fires uh, just built using the API from two of the uh, Copernicus services started to develop their own little app to inform other citizens about the spreading of the forest fires. Uh, so it's also that's also kind of benefit and value that is generated but that has nothing to do with existing work process but is rather new initiatives but it creates some economic value and so societal value because uh, well there are new users new citizens that are directly involved uh, by using the infrastructure so in this sense we do not only look to uh, automation and, and and direct benefits from that but it's a little bit broader Um, Andy or Emily, do you want to respond to that? Sorry, we well, be on you. No. While Emily's thinking, should I just uh, um, jump in? Uh, I think that um, uh, one of the uh, things that I would observe is that the the number of case studies where um, good quantitative work has been done is increasing. There have been some very good studies um, in the developed world in, in Canada looking at the uh, uh, GDP impact of uh, geo-information. Uh, there's also been others in, uh, in Australia and uh, in the US uh, a big study was undertaken looking at the uh, uh, value of creating digital terrain models for for flood management. Um, what we lack at the moment as an industry is uh, a database where these are brought together so that um, researchers uh, have case studies that they can go back and refer to. Emily said about the problems of, of, of getting hold of data. Um, we're in a better position, but we don't really have a a database and if we look across to the environmental community uh, they have something called every which is the environmental value research inventory uh, and that has around about 3,000 different studies most of them willingness to pay uh, around uh, the justification of, uh, of environmental uh, projects uh, and what we really need in the geo industry um, and if you like that's that's my call to action from this uh, is to create that database so that we're not all starting from scratch. 
Great, thank you. And there's, um, I think we're gonna, um, we're gonna have to close up soon. But I just want to ask one more question. And Emily, if you feel, you know, you have a response to this, perhaps you can respond. Um, but you know, I'd like to bring it back to uh, ESIP and the role that ESIP could play in, in maybe streamlining some of these information pathways. Um, and particularly the idea of the importance of intermediaries. So perhaps thinking about ESIP as being this intermediary organization. Um, do you all um, have any comments about how ESIP could contribute towards um, trying to streamline or improve the value and in information pathways? Sure, this is Emily. I could um, maybe kick off that, that one and, um, you know, I think all of all of these projects need to be interdisciplinary. So, um, as ESIP members have ideas about either new and emerging information products or existing products that you know they they would find a lot of use in understanding the value, partnering with with people um, in economics, you know, reaching out to to any of us, I think is is really helpful to understand wh where these studies are needed. And knowing, you know, the, the supply side of it to help us also begin to get our arms around who the users are. Um, so I think any, any amount of energy devoted to just understanding the use, even if it's not quantifying it, and, and collaborating with um, your friendly economist, I think is, would be a great thing. Thank you. Perhaps yeah. a last comment from Danny? Perhaps. Yeah, maybe I want to build further upon uh, Andrew's uh, ID. Uh, I think we still need to know better how the value chain works in practice. Um, so uh, collecting cases where that is explained and showcased would be very useful. And yes, it might do kind of documenting of those cases and having kind of central repository where uh, other researchers can look into in what has been done already. So it's a little bit beyond only having a list of studies, but also uh, in a more standardized way, maybe document those those particular cases and um, making it available to the different communities. Yeah, I just just to tie off on that, I, I would agree completely, um, Danny. We just need somebody to come up with the money. Um, the, uh, the, the final thing I'd add is that uh, communicating to decision makers um, is the other part of this equation. It's fine doing this work. Uh, we still need further uh, work on, on refining uh, how we get our messages across. And that's certainly, I would have thought, something that ESIP might be able to contribute towards. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to thank again our um, three presenters. Um, we heard about um, using the approaches of value chains for different applications and use cases. Um, from Emily, we heard about um, stream gauges and um, how decision trees can be particularly useful for improving the return of investment. Um, and, um, and we also heard about different methods um, that uh, we could use for um, addressing um, the, the assessment of value for these different use cases. Um, and from Danny's presentation, we heard about how we could possibly improve the, um, the use and uptake of Copernicus data, which I think can be also be applied to other um, sources and streams of, of data, and particularly the importance of skills development and how important that is for trying to improve the, the socioeconomic use of earth science data. Um, and, and just to, to finish up, um, for some uh, closing remarks. Um, so thanks once again to our presenters and um, I'd like to bring your attention to um, the rest of our webinar series. Um, the next one will be in September, on September 4th, um, measuring and assessing the socioeconomic value. So please stay tuned for that. Um, be aware that the webinar series is all recorded on the ESIP YouTube channel, and I'll put up all of the links here in just a minute. Um, please sign in to the, to the sign-in sheet. Um, there's the link there, and it's also in the chat box. 
Um, and then in terms of ESIP, um, if, if you're interested in following ESIP, there's uh, the ESIP Monday update. I'm putting everything into the chat here, so you have it all. Um, uh, there's uh, the ESIP collaboration areas, if there's any you'd like to join. There's about maybe 15 of them. Um, there's the ESIP winter meeting. ESIP has two um, meetings per year. Um, so the next one's in January in Bethesda. Um, and then ESIP also has a new um, publication um, in uh, respect to uh, the, some data collected from the ESIP community in regards to community resilience. And then in regards to the uh, Geo Valley community, um, please join the Geo Valley community. There's the link there. I will also put this up here in the chat box. I'm sorry, here's the community. And as uh, Andy also spoke about, there is the link to the GeoValue book that came out last year. Um, two of the presenters are featured in there, as well as some of our co-organizers, um, Francois uh, Perlman and Jay Perlman. And then around the community, there's two um, conferences that might be of interest to some of the audience. So with that, thank you very much for everybody's participation. Um, and um, I hope to see you at the next webinar and series. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.